planet Earth. A world of mystery and imagination, science and wonder that is constantly being gazed upon and unraveled by the finest minds humanity has to offer. Welcome to the UniV podcast, the show that presents a free-flowing conversation with those beings at the very center of the world of academia and research from all around the globe with your host, Simon Holland. Hello and welcome to episode nine of the UniV podcast. Today we chat to Professor Rodri Jeffries-Jones. Rodri is Professor Emeritus of American History at the University of Edinburgh and has made a career delving into the history of espionage and secret intelligence agencies around the world. He took his PhD at the University of Cambridge and has been a postdoctoral fellow and visiting professor at Harvard and the University of Toronto. Rodri is the author of more than a dozen books, such as American Espionage, From Secret Service to CIA, In Spies We Trust, and most recently, The American Left, which took out the Newstad Prize and contained an interview with Bernie Sanders. Rodri also has a new book on the way entitled The Story of Surveillance, due early next year. Now, we've employed a top-secret strategy during this episode to thwart any potential government wiretaps that might be occurring by employing a handyman to bang in a few nails in the background. Actually, we do apologise, as we were both caught a bit surprised during the interview, and we really weren't expecting this guy to put in so much overtime. However, it is in the background, so it shouldn't cause too much distress. Without further ado, we welcome Professor Rodri Jeffries-Jones to the show. I got into espionage history because... First of all, I was interested in labor espionage, you know, um, employers spying on their workers and so on. And that gave rise to a wider interest in espionage. So I got into that. Now, there is a problem here with getting the uh, archival sources because obviously it's a secret profession and they try to keep things under wraps. So on the one hand, uh, there are certain nuggets of information that you can't get your, your hands on. On the other hand, there's a plethora of information because people are so interested in the subject of spies and espionage that there's a massive amount out there that you have to sift through. Tell us a little bit how you, your journey into it. How did you start? What did you start studying, and, and how did you deviate into this field? Well, um, I think that uh, originally I wanted to go into politics, and, uh, and I was going to uh, run as a, an MP for the uh, Labour Party in, uh, in the UK. That gave me uh, an interest in la- labor history, and I developed especially uh, an interest in violence, industrial relations. I, I was looking into violence, and um, one of the uh, debating points there was the role of private detective agencies in uh, the employment of uh, employers who wanted to combat labor unions and the violence that took place between the private detective agencies and workers. So um, I found myself in Harvard University on a, on a fellowship, and there was a, a guy there called Dragulio Bzivinovich, who was from Belgrade, and uh, he, he'd been working in a library in uh, Yale University and had come across the papers of Somerset Maugham, the English novelist. And he said that uh, it appeared from these papers that Somerset Maugham was a British agent in the First World War, operating in Switzerland and then operating in uh, St. Petersburg. And would it be uh, a good expansion of my interests in clandestine matters to go and have a look at these papers? So I went down to uh, the Sterling Library in Yale, had a look at these papers and eventually wrote paper, which was published as an article in the American Quarterly. At that point, this was um, around 1975, at that point, uh, American politics was suddenly taken up with the great scandal over the CIA, with uh, several congressional inquiries taking place. The subject was the main theme of American newspaper articles and, and editorials throughout the year 1975. So um, I thought, well, why don't I expand my interest and write a book about it, which I did. And it came out in 77. It was called American Espionage, published with the uh, Free Press and was one of the first documented histories of uh, American intelligence. So that led then to the publisher, the Free Press, asking me if I could do a history of the CIA. And um, so I wrote a history of the CIA now, things didn't go well with free press, but that ended up getting published by Yale University Press. And having written the uh, history of the CIA, well, why not write the history of the FBI? So that came out as a further book with the same press. And in the meantime, I'd written another book updating my general history of espionage that was called Cloak and Dollar. And then uh, I started to have dealings with Oxford University Press in England, and they wanted me to write a handbook for their handbook series, Handbook on spying and espionage. And I said, 
I didn't really fancy doing that, but would they like a history of Anglo-American intelligence relations uh, and the way in which the European Union was now developing an alternative intelligence structure? That came out as in, in Spies We Trust. So that um, particular book had uh, an American, uh, sorry, had an Austra uh, Australian dimension because, of course, it takes into account five eyes, the intelligence arrangements between uh, Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand and Britain, whereby we share signals intelligence. Since then, the whole uh, debate over surveillance has uh, taken place. So uh, I've recently completed a book, which will also be published by Oxford University Press, on uh, called The Story of Surveillance, in which I go into surveillance and return to some of my old themes, labour espionage, for example. But this book concentrates on the, the UK and the uh, United States and has, incidentally, uh, another theme of potential Australian interest in that I look at the practice of hacking by newspapers. And a, a certain Mr. Murdoch has been a prominent capacity <laughs> as the owner of some of the newspapers which have been uh, involved in that. Did you ever worry at any point dealing with sensitive topics and looking for information in sensitive areas that you suddenly <laughs> have, you know, talking to people that might have different agendas? Well, I, I, I came to the uh, attention of the security services a long time ago because I was involved in the anti-apartheid campaign. So when I first applied for a visa to go to the United States, I got a phone call from my, my father and he said that the bishop, the local bishop, had been in touch with him. And um, they'd been asked by uh, MI5, our security service in Britain, uh, to supply them with a report about me because the Americans wanted this report. It was going over to the FBI and uh, you know they were considering my visa. So I... I knew they had something on, on, on me then. Uh, but I, I got around that um, by dictating uh, an encomium about myself <laughs> to my father, who then dictated it to the bishop, who then dictated it to MI5, who then dictated it to the FBI, and then my visa came through. Okay, So once you think, well, they've got my name on record and they've got a file on me, you kind of stop worrying about it. You know, I think some people worry that they might get into these files for the first time. And uh, it's more of a concern for a lot of people that uh, maybe the, the file they've got on you isn't uh, all that interesting. But sometimes uh, you, you get a bit worried. For example, uh, I gave a paper uh, years and years ago in the, in, the, in the early days of interest in the history of intelligence to a conference in Washington, D.C. It was in the Catholic University, I think. And I noticed that um, right along the first row, there were maybe eight or ten guys who didn't look like academics at all. You know, they were wearing suits and ties and all that good stuff. And they all had recording equipment. So I turned to the chairman and I said, what's going on here? And he said, well, these guys, these guys, they're from the intelligence agencies because there are lots of them in, the, in, in Washington, D.C. This was in Washington. And I felt a bit perturbed at that point. Even more perturbed when they didn't switch the uh, equipment on. They didn't record me. I felt kind of let down. Oh, you know, aren't I, aren't I interesting enough to, for them to spy on? But then the discussion period came along and they switched their kit on and they were all listening to the other guys. So what they were doing, the FBI is spying on the CIA and vice versa and the National Security Agency wanted to know what they were up to and they were recording what all the other guys said so that they could report back to their bosses because all these guys are rivals, you know, they are all bidding for congressional funds against each other and so on. I've been really looking forward to talking to you because um, it is such an interesting business and I think the best thing was reading your books, you started from the start you know, if we, when we read Inspires We Trust, you talk about the Ku Klux Klan and the development of the American secret agents, then the development of the British, and then the integration between the trickery that's occurred, I guess, with World War One. Can you talk us through that? So the sort of foundations of these types of secret services. Well, um, the modern secret services uh, really didn't uh, get going until the late 19th century. You know, if you're looking at a continuous bureaucracy, which operates all the time, and um, they really... Uh, reached a, a state of high efficiency in the First World War. Well, the Brits uh, were in advance of the Americans because we were in the war earlier. They didn't get into the war until 1917. And uh, in one particular regard, uh, we had a leg up on them. We had uh, a code-breaking unit in the Admiralty, which is called Room 40, which had um, developed the capacity to, pro to break and to read German codes. We were also reading American codes and just about the codes of everybody. Uh, but the German codes were, of course, important because we were um, at, at war with them. So we could tell where the submarines were. The two big battles in the First World War, Dogger Bank 
and Jutland, we knew that the German ships were going to break out. So we had the Royal Navy there in position ready to stymie them. And it was quite a major contribution to the Allied victory in, in, in the war. But at the same time, we um, discovered that the Americans were preparing for um, war with the United States in 1917. And they made the Mexicans an offer. The Alfred Zimmerman, the foreign minister in the German government, made the Mexican an offer, a secret offer, sending a telegram in code saying if there is a war between the US and and uh, and Germany and you come on in on our side then we will restore to you the territory that you lost in the Mexican war of the 1840s so they would get back from the United States Texas California Arizona New Mexico and uh, Nevada that was the Ameri- that was the German offer now very unlikely that the Mex- Mexicans would have listened to that offer but it was a great uh, opportunity for British propaganda to showed the Americans that the Germans were up to skullduggery. So we intercepted the telegram, we decoded it, and showed the text first to the American ambassador and then to the American government. And it was one of the factors that brought America into the war. No, the um, Americans were very happy to cooperate with British intelligence, but at the same time, they felt that they were being um, led by the nose and they wanted their own uh, intel- intelligence capability. So they turned to the guys in charge of Room 40 and said, give us the, the German code books that, that you've worked out so that we can do this kind of stuff our- ourselves. And the British rather patronizingly in the British way, he said, you don't, you, don't, you don't need that stuff. No, we'll tell you everything you need to know. And that um, pissed the Americans off. And they set up a unit which came to be known as the American Black Chamber, which is a code-breaking unit of, of their own. And in the 1920s, that was quite an effective unit. Moving forward from there, in the Second World War, you have a repeat, a repeat history. The British uh, were in the war, along with Australia and the rest of the Commonwealth. From 1939, uh, the Americans didn't come in until 1941. So again, we we had a start on the Americans and we developed uh, the ability to read quite a lot of the uh, German codes. And when the um, Americans realized they were going to have to come into the war, they sent a a mission over from the army and the navy to try to learn the secrets. And again, they said, give us the, the code books so we can do this ourselves. And Churchill said, absolutely no way. We're not going to give this to them. But then uh, the balance began to change because the, the Americans uh, began to develop a code-breaking capability of their own. And they had two big advantages. One was IBM, the uh, computer manufacturer. I mean, I say I, I'm not advertising IBM. You know, they had, they had the comp- computer expertise at their disposal. And of course, that was the way forward in code breaking, use of computers, because it can work much faster than the human brain. And and second, um, they had a lot of people who spoke Japanese. And uh, what brought the Americans into the war was Pearl Harbor, the attack by the Japanese fleet on the American fleet in uh, in Hawaii. So it, was cru- so it was now a two ocean naval war. And the Americans were able to read the Japanese messages that, the, that they decoded. So parity was achieved with the British. And at that point, the British decided they were going to share. We, sh- we shared what we had with the Americans, and they shared what they had with us. And that's the basis of the, it goes by various names. One is the special intelligence relationship between Britain and uh, America, which is pretty much upheld today. People are very strongly defensive of, of that. And it gave rise to Five Eyes, which involved um, other quite Commonwealth countries, including Australia. So Australia, for example, had um, a facility in Pine Gap, in northern Australia, which is important in uh, tracking the movements of Russian and later Chinese uh, satellites. So all all these countries cooperated with with each other. So that's the situation since the Second World War. But of course, the balance of power has changed because the Americans have a much greater code-breaking capacity now than uh, any of the other countries because they're richer. They've got more computers. uh, You get more bang for bucks. And I also think that after the war, the 1950s really was a golden age for spy culture. You look at the old movies, you look at the books, you know, that sort of magic. And it was for British as well. It's definitely with you know bonds later on and things but the 50s sort of s- seemed to capture the imagination of the americans and almost inspired a generation to go i'm getting into this business you know, was that was that the case the golden age what you have in the 40s and the uh, 50s is a number of films which are produced with the cooperation of the cia and uh, its predecessor in the uh, second world war the office of strategic services the oss are they actually sponsored for example 13 re madeleine which is one of the classic um, spy films of the 1940s was sponsored by the intelligence uh, agencies to take another example you know the famous novel by um, george orwell 1984 which is written about 
how the other guys spied and they, and they were bad, you know, the, the baddies spying. He wrote two novels, Animal Farm, came out in 45 and 1984, which came out in 1949. The CIA bought the rights to both of those and um, brought them out in pictorial form, you know, cartoon form, um, made movies out of them. Uh, and um, they uh, made it very plain that George Orwell was attacking the Russians. Actually, George Orwell was attacking the Soviet Union, but he was also attacking all forms of autocracy. So th- there's this era in the 40s and 50s where people are still willing to believe what the intelligence chiefs tell them. They believe what the government tells them. They love this idea of the of the brave, adventurous spy. And it's also the what you, you might call the golden age of operations. Operations, that is, um, and clandestine operations, as the thing from sending in spies. You're sending in guys, you know, to overturn governments and bribe officials and so on. And it's rega- regarded as golden age because one of, one of these, two of these operations worked, such as the overthrow of the Iranian government government in 1953 and the overthrow of the uh, Guatemalan government in 1954. Um, Less success in Indonesia, but people just remember the the, the triumphs. So moving forward then into what you mentioned, the Bond era. Um, Well, Bond, uh, no, he's just beginning to um, uh, laugh, you know, he's beginning to laugh at espionage. You know, he's a great hero. But it's it's reduced to kind of farcical level where people are beginning to ask questions and not take it all that seriously. The Americans, the American public loved Bond. He was a fantastic success in the box office when, when the movies were made of the of the Fleming novels. Um, but the leadership in America, uh, for example, Alan Dulles, who was head of the CIA, they hated Bond because he was British. You know, we we so they wanted an American Bond, and they actually tried to commission some people to write American novels to, uh, to rival that. So you've got this period in the, um, in the 60s. People are getting a bit uh, ironic. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a famous incident which um, illustrates this, which is um, uh, Ian Fleming, who was an, uh, the author of the Bond novels, was invited to have dinner with John F. Kennedy and a group of other people in, um, in the Kennedy home in uh, 1960. Now, Kennedy had been... Uh, elected president of the United States, but was not yet in office. And um, uh, Castro had just taken over in Cuba, and it is becoming plain that Castro was leaning to the left. So uh, Kennedy turned to Ian Fleming and said, uh, well, what would would James Bond do about this guy, Castro? So um, Fleming, with tongue-in-cheek, because he was trying to amuse people in in a dinner party, said, well, you know, you could give him an exploding cigar, uh, or you could put a, a poison clamshell in his famous in his favourite um, bathing place, or you could um, give him a decapitatory drug to make his beard fall out, because then he'll lose his machismo. You know, because Cubans they only love people with beards. He was joking, you know. But there was a guy there called John uh, uh, Gross, who was um, uh, from the CIA, high official in the CIA. And was watching Kennedy's face. Kennedy seemed to be lapping it all up. He went back and told Dulles, the director of the CIA, this is what the president wants. And the CIA did all these things to try to get rid of, you know, they just, they just didn't, they didn't get the joke. But a lot of people were beginning to get the joke about uh, espionage. Um, but then moving forward to the uh, 1970s, perhaps you get um, more kind of outright criticism of the CIA. That coincides with the... Uh, with the congressional investigations of the 1970s. And um, I think that people are uh, taking a critical view of spying in other countries as well. Over in this country, for example, uh, for the first time, people admitted there was a place called GCHQ, you know, which is the code-breaking place <coughs> um, in Cheltenham. In Australia, you had the uh, Gough Whitlam scandal, where... Governor General of Australia dismissed Gough Whitlam. Um, there was a pressure brought to bear on him by the CIA, people who didn't, didn't like uh, Whitlam's uh, policies. And that made the whole issue of uh, espionage controversial in Australia as well. So people are more critical from the uh, 1970s on. In the 60s was kind of the rise of that liberation period, uh, definitely the rise of the left of, of that period. 
And so media went from, when I think of, you know, early um, propaganda films from the, the American government, you sort of think of, you know, reefer madness and, and those kind of like infomercial films, I guess. But the media really took a turn after the 60s when people were like, you know what, we've had enough of this. And then you started to hear those stories filter out about recruitment and spies and the government's doing this and the government's doing that, and that kind of overthrow of oppression. Now, if we shift forward another, you know, 40, 50 years, we're in 2016 now, and you kind of see that movement again. And you broach that in your new book, The American Left. Can we talk a little bit about where we're at these days? Because we've had big movements on both the, the surveillance of a population and also the liberation movement from a governmental perspective or a candidate. Yeah, I think you can see it uh, in terms of uh, seesaw. In the, in the 70s, there was a big uprising against uh, the secret state and you had um, Freedom of Information Acts being passed in a lot of countries. And uh, America had a, a Government in the Sunshine Act. And so there was a, an attempt to place limitations on what the intelligence agencies were allowed to do. As, as time went by, people began to question that and say, maybe the intelligence agencies are being shackled too much. But the big event which caused people to change their minds was 9-11. So you could, as in a lot of cases, you can say 9-11 was an intelligence failure. You'd think that they would punish the intelligence agencies. But the standard, the standard response, and this happens after other intelligence crises as well, is don't punish them. Just give them more money so that they can do a better job and give them more powers so that they can do a better job. So by this time, the CIA is becoming less important, but there's um, a whole intelligence um, superstructure now in America and uh, in its allies as well. And they, they, they're given a lot more money and a lot more powers. And um, in, in the United States, for example, they had um, a, a president's emergency uh, investigatory unit, which allowed the president to tell the intelligence services to basically spy on everybody. So the NSA was soaking up everybody's telephone calls and emails and, and all the rest of it. People were opposing this, but they didn't really have the, the support of the public because people still remembered 9-11. And, and of course, there were other terrorist attacks in Paris and London and Madrid, and people were afraid of any uh, repetitions. Ultimately, however, you then began the the, the Snowden era, and, and Snowden, I mean, in a way, he didn't say all that much that was all that new, but he re re released a whole torrent of information confirming what a lot of people had said was going on, and people began to worry about this uh, total intrusion into privacy that was going on on the part of the governments of, of most countries in the world by this time. Although, one of the points I'm trying to make in uh, my next book on, on surveillance is that uh, a lot of the surveillance comes from private sources and not from governments. For example, George Orwell's um, last house in London where he lived when 1984 came out, the Daily Mail, which is a newspaper in, in the UK, published a diagram of the number of CCTV cameras within 150 yards of George Orwell's house. And there were 38 of them, 38 of these within 150 yards. And um, so the headline in the mail was 1984 has arrived. But a little lo local newspaper, the Islington Tribune, pointed out every single one of those CCTV cameras was private. You know, Orwell was, talk Orwell, Orwell was afraid of the intrusive state and mind control from Big Brother. But in fact... Private surveillance is, is a very, very widespread uh, occurrence. When you when you look at something like Google, where everything's recorded, I'm sure that your Google history must be on the list <laughs> in your research. That's something where they can gather bulk data. How does a government sort of pass through that data and look for information that's relevant, as opposed to, you know, funny cat pictures, searches, and things like that? Well, um, that's, that's an interesting question, actually. Uh, I know that uh, where, where words uh, are concerned, they've got software which has a number of keywords, and they look for those keywords. And um, if they find concentrations of those keywords, I mean, for example, bomb is an obvious example. Right. There you go. You've just, got, uh, you know, you just made us pop up on that it, list. <laughs> yeah, it, it, a group of people use the bomb, the word bomb a long time, you know, many times, and they're going to look into them further, you know, and take a closer look. And then... Um, that's, that's done by machines. That's all done by computer. To actually read the messages, you could have a, a warrant in most countries. Uh, the government issue a warrant. And then um, human eyes can fall on the actual, the whole passage, you know, not just keywords that have been identified. The, the other thing they look for is um, aut autarkic manifestations. Let's say you've got a group of people. They never use the word bomb, ever. That's suspicious. Because in the normal course of events, you and I and our friends and family well, you know, every 100,000 words, we'll use the word bomb, you know. But if, if people are very, very careful not to use it, then that's suspicious as well. So they've got these algorithms enhanced by computer technology, which 
help them to do that. But uh, you, you raise an interesting question. I'm not sure that I know the answer. Images. What can they do about images? I guess that computers can probably do that. You know, they can identify suspicious images. I don't want to give them any ideas, anyone that's thinking of doing any suspicious. So why I want to talk about the way that you write, actually, because how do you, when you start to structure a book, are you forming images in your head? Because I was thinking, when I read your writing, I think in very cinematic terms, you must... It must have a very cinematic start. One of my favorite stories you talked a little bit about before was the Russians destroying the Magdeburg, the German light carrier, and the German officer was clutching the the, the code book. That's how he went down, and yes. they got yeah. a hold yeah. of that. When I was reading that passage, that I was kind of watching that in my head. And then a few chapters later, there was a story about, I think his name was Futures. It was a German, was a future, maybe I'm saying that wrong. Futures, the German guy. <laughs> and he was carrying a tennis ball into a meeting with the guy with the green glove and the... It's all very so oh, yeah. cinematic yeah. style, yeah. Can we talk about the style, yeah. you know, how you think about it and how you generate this sort of ideas? In, in order to uh, communicate, you, you have to use images because if you just talk in terms of uh, abstractions and uh, chronologies and, and data, you're wasting your time because people aren't going to read that. So you've got to bring in the uh, uh, the anecdotes or the story, provided that they actually illustrate the points that you're you're trying to make. The, 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 the guy you're talking about was Fuchs, who, uh, Klaus Fuchs, who carried the tennis ball as a, it is part of the trade craft, you know, so that his uh, Russian intelligence controller would recognize who, who, who he was. So, yeah, and, and uh, I quite like to look at uh, personalities, quite interesting personalities. So you can tell a story. Uh, I quite like doing that. And also uh, d- develop uh, someone's character so that people know what the guy is like. I mean, Fuchs is an interesting person in that he, he was a, a German, but he was a German communist um, when, uh, when Hitler came into power and had to leave um, uh, Germany for that reason and uh, decided that he would spy for the uh, Soviet Union. But then he was an atomic uh, scientist. He, he, he was probably the most important into- atomic scientist. He thought that it was unfair that one, one, one side had a monopoly of um, uh, atomic uh, technology. Uh, at, at the time, in any case, uh, the Soviet Union was allied to the United States. And he was involved with a Manhattan uh, program in America to develop nuclear weapons. So he handed over the material, huge amounts of material, to his Soviet controllers. I think that also he, um, my suspicion is he thought that the Brits should have some of the American t- technology as well and handed over some American technology to the Brits just when the Americans were beginning, becoming a little bit proprietorial about this information, a bit secretive about it. Uh, and the reason I say that is that the Brits were... were very reluctant to hand them over to the to the Russian to the FBI for interrogation. So he, he's an interesting person. You know, uh, do you consider him to be uh, a man of principle or or is he a, a, an outright uh, traitor? And uh, these little details, like the tennis ball, are interesting. And I find it interesting that he was. I, I live in Edinburgh, and he came to Edinburgh just before the war and did an additional PhD. He already had a PhD, and he lived in a street quite near me. That's quite interesting to go along, look at the house. You know. He, how should I get a picture of the guy? I did quite like that because you can find out a bit about yourself reading the books because you talk about Alfred Ewing, same way that in Edinburgh, the house named after him and students would see it when they're walking down. I quite like reading a little bit about that as well. Actually, I actually uh, stayed in uh, Ewing House when I first came up to Edinburgh. Right? I never realized why it was called the Ewing House. Uh, another guy who stayed there for a while was Gordon Brown, who became Prime Minister of, uh, of Britain. But uh, yeah, U- U- Ewing is a fascinating... In fact, I'm just... Writing a bit, I found some more uh, letters written by Ewing because he gave he was in charge of Room 40 in the uh, First World War, and in 1927 he gave a lecture in Edinburgh explaining what Room 40 had done. The Admiralty was furious with him because he was giving away secrets. They threatened to prosecute him under the Official uh, Secrets Act. But I've come across his defense, his defense for divulging the information is very interesting uh, because um, today you associate that kind of defense with guys like um, Snowden, you know, who are anti-establishment figures, essentially. Anti-establishment. Ewing was very much part of the establishment. But in spite of that, he believed in telling the story of what had happened in the First World War. And he issued a, a, a defense, defense such as, for example, uh, historians must know what's happened in the past. Otherwise, you know, we, we can't handle uh, future, future problems. He also advanced the reason that we only, we only should act in this rather undesirable way, you know, spying on other people in an emergency such as war. We don't have to do it in peacetime. So the war was 10 years ago. 
I, I can talk about it. Now, why shouldn't I talk about it? Because that war was 10 years ago. And that was something that really annoyed Dan Brody because they were continuing to spy on, every, on everybody in the uh, 1920s. They, they didn't want anybody to say that. So Ewing, so Ewing was the principal of, of my university at the time when, when that happened. That he was you know, brought up in Scotland. He was an engineer, uh, reformed education in Japan, reformed education in Cambridge, reformed naval education. And he had kind of interesting anecdotes about how ignorant naval officers were, you know, before he reformed the educational system. How do documents, so you, you said you just come across those letters, how does a document like that survive the, the sweeping under the carpet of <laughs> the government? Ah, uh, well, a lot of them are swept under the carpet. Um, and, and you get spurious explanations about um, why, why this had happened. Uh, for example, there's a notorious event in uh, in British history, the um, Zinoviev letter. Zinoviev was the Russian foreign minister, and uh, the British newspapers on the eve of the 1924 general election, when there was a Labour government in office, published this letter purporting to come from Russia, from the Soviet Union, urging basically uh, a revolution in uh, in the UK, and the Labour government fell. You know, people were afraid of communism. The letter was uh, the letter was a forgery. And there's a question as to whether our secret services, MI6 in particular, uh, were involved in propagating the letter in conjunction with the, with the Conservative Party. Nobody's found the, found the correspondence on this. So I went and looked and looked in the national and the uh, in the public record office in in London. And I had the serial numbers. You know, these documents have serial numbers. They run continuously, and they, they told me that these particular letters had been lost in a fire. But this flat fire had leapt from one page to the other, you know, missing out pages in between. I wish the pages had been taken out, weeded and, and disposed of, no doubt, no doubt burnt. But how does some, some, uh, how does some information survive? Well, the answer in this case and in other cases, case of Ewing, is private papers. You know, the government can't chase after private individuals and get them to, they can tell them never keep any, any uh, official documents in your, uh, you know, at home, they can tell them that, but people don't always obey that. And then, and, and in any case, in some cases, the uh, documents don't originate with the government. The, 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 the originator is the in, individual concerned. So quite a few I came across another case uh, recently. I wrote an article about a guy who um, was involved with um, the SOE, the Strategic Operations Executive, the Secret Service in World War Two, which ran operations right around the world, uh, and, and, and undercover special operations. This guy parachuted in from their base in North Africa to Vichy, France, to undermine the Nazi rule there and help the French resistance. Now, the official papers were all destroyed at the end of the Second World War, completely destroyed. So this important, important operation, you know, there are no records for historians to look at. But this one guy kept a very detailed diary together with some, some documents in his private papers. So managed to get hold of those and, you know, throw his light on, on what happened in France in 1944 when the Allies invaded and the French resistance blew up all the bridges. You know, he gives an account of all that. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not a, a genius of doing this. Other historians have found pri private papers to be helpful. Where government papers are sometimes a problem. But when you have a little breakthrough like that and you get to live in that person's mind for the year or how long the book would go for, that must be a really magic, sort of a magical experience from your perspective. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> in keeping with the under the sweeping under the carpet, I guess the world really watched the Enigma Code. Uh, what was it called? I forgot the name of the movie. But the Enigma of the Benedict Cumberbatch movie where he was yeah. the Alan Turing in the machine. And the treatment of Alan Turing after he'd done such a great service. Can we talk a little bit about that? Just how he was treated by the government afterwards. Why that would be the case, was it? Well, he, he wasn't uh, particularly sympathetically uh, treated at, at the time. The guy in charge of uh, code-breaking at that stage in the war uh, was a guy called uh, Alistair D Deniston. And he comes across in the film as a um, very stern and unfriendly guy who ob obstructed Turing's work as a code breaker. In fact, there was a, 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 but there was a letter in the, um, in the Telegraph when the film came out. His grandchildren, Alistair Den Denison's, Denison's grandchildren, uh, wrote to the Telegraph complaining that their father had got a, a raw deal and that Turing wasn't really treated all that badly. So that it's, you know, it's a divisive uh, issue. Um, but b basically the uh, issue with Turing was... Uh, the fact that he was gay, of course, and it's um, uh, there was un undoubtedly homophobia directed against him, 
And it got to such. I mean, it's difficult to imagine the day when. I mean, there is homophobia, but you know, not to the degree that it was then. Difficult to imagine the impact that that, that would have on someone's uh, self-esteem and uh, personality, and it, of course, uh, drove him to take his own life. Now, now, of course, he's a hero. I mean, the CIA. I think it's the CIA. They have a special Alan Turing, Turing uh, award, you know, to reward people who do very well in the world of espionage. Uh, <laughs> the Oscars. Do they, they. I guess they don't read that out loudly. They don't have a big <laughs> pay-per-view event or anything. Oh, no, they, no, they don't. No. Uh, they, 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 they want to do that because um, uh, when George Bush Senior was president, uh, he dropped the requirements that there should be no gays in the in the uh, CIA and I think the FBI as well. You know, he, he just he just dropped that because time times are changing. I mean, you're de- depriving yourself of a pool of talent, and also if if you uh, if you um, say that uh, gays are perfidious and shouldn't be employed to do intelligence work. You're giving the opposition a chance to blackmail people who are undercover gays. So it is a sensible sensible thing to do. So the, the whole attitude has now changed. And the, the, given the degree of political correctness that you have uh, in America, you know, I mean, they, they celebrate these guys now. There's no problem. When people finish for the service like CIA, you hear about people disappearing or... Is that a real risk that you run? I guess that, you know, have... If you do a double agent, do they make their own rules, or is that kind of a figment of imagination, Hollywood kind of stuff? Uh, well, the, uh, I'm certainly a lot of people have uh, disappeared, of course. That's for sure. I gave lots of examples of that. They, they would tend not to be uh, the CIA, CIA uh, and, and other intelligence agencies as well. This would be the case with ASIO and Australia and MI6 and so on. Uh, make a distinction between an, an intelligence officer, so you're a regular salaried employee of an intelligence agency um, with full security clearance and all that, and an agent. So the CIA guys say, we're not agents, we're officers. But then they go out and they recruit agents. So the agent typically is a native of the country that's being spied on. So if you're uh, spying on Ghana, say, your agent will be a Ghanaian who's agreed to work for you and spy on other Ghanaians or spy on the Soviet embassy or whatever. And those are the guys who disappear. Those are the guys who have unfortunate accidents. Another category of uh, people disappearing, of course, is uh, the, those who are in political opposition to regimes that um, the uh, particular country supports. So Latin America would be a serious case of this. For example, in um, in the case of Chile, where the government was overthrown with, certainly with the involvement of the CIA, though I think it's debatable whether the CIA actually overthrew the IND government in uh, 1973, but um, certainly the CIA was involved there. One uh, consequence of the advent of the Pinochet regime was a lot of people disappeared. That's a Secret Service thing. You know, they, they get identified, they're spied on, they're identified, and they are disappeared. You know, they're killed, in other words. So it's not, it's not, that's not a melodramatic depiction of what uh, Secret Services are up to, and that, that's, that certainly happens. Now, let's go back to, um, I guess, I'd like to talk about your rankings of important moments, I guess, in espionage and, and dependence on the war. So it's often talked about Turing being a critical moment, that the Enigma machine being a critical moment in the war, like a turning point in the war. Do you think that's the case? Who's your kind of favorite? I mean, we talked about the Ewings, we talked about the Wisemans, guys like that. Who do you think are your personal favorites, people that so much was dependent on being at that place at that time, doing that thing, being that person, instrumental in directing history forward? What would, what's your favorite, if we can count down? Well, I think it, you're looking at particularly at uh, cryptographers, and uh, you know so, so some people have been quite, quite talented. In this country, certainly Turing was uh, was was one of them. Ewing, I think he deserves a lot of credit, not because he was a brilliant cryptographer himself, so he did have a serious interest in it, but because he was a good organizer, and uh, he, he you know he pulled everything together and uh, and made it work. There's the Magdeburg instance where he got the code book. Then there, he, there was another um, code book on, on, a, on a boat in, in the North Sea. You know, he pulled all that together, hired the mathematicians. He realized we need mathematicians working on this. People hadn't really realized before, you know, the level of expertise required. So he, he I would say he's, he's a hero, certainly, in the, in the First World War. He was succeeded by a guy called um, Blinker Hall, uh, who you could say is a, is, is a hero. He was behind the Zimmerman telegram and the handling of the Zimmerman t- telegram. But then he became uh, infamous after the war because he was involved with the Zenobia Fletcher affair, trying to smear the Labour Party and set up uh, a strike-breaking agency called the Economic League. So, you know, you're looking at a black and white case, a white and black case there. Turing, uh, and Turing's um, colleagues in Bletchley Park, because he moved to Bletchley Park in the, uh, in, the, in the Second World War, certainly did a great job. But there's a question in my mind about 
quite how important it was. Now, there's a guy called F.H. Hinsley who worked there in the war and was later a history professor at Cambridge University and became the official historian of um, British intelligence. And he reckons that the codebreakers shortened the war by three years by giving Britain uh, an advantage. So if it's shortened the war by three years, think of all the extra people that would, would have been killed in, in that three-year period, the economic resources that would have been squandered, you know, the political dislocation. That's a big, big claim. I think that uh, he's being subjective, personally, because he was involved there. Other things were going on. For one thing, the, the Germans had good intelligence in the Second World War, but it tended to be field intelligence uh, rather than strategic intelligence. But that's very important to have good field intelligence. Second, it, it, it overlooks the fact that the Americans dropped an atomic bomb in 1945. That was going to end the war, regardless of, uh, of intelligence. You, you could argue that kind of demeans the role of the fighting man in the Second World War when you say that the, if you guys wearing spectacles, you know, suddenly behind fancy machines, won the war, you know. Basically, the war was won because guys were willing to risk their lives and go into battle. So there's an element of truth in what he says. Uh, certainly, they did some useful work, but it's to be kept into perspective. On the American side, there's one very famous cryptologist called uh, Herbert Yardley. But it seems to me that his chief skill was in promoting himself this a, in, in the 1920s. He had a colleague at the time called Frieden, who was a much better analyst. And he was a guy who ran American intelligence effectively, effectively from the te technical point of view. He was a guiding genius in the Second World War. So he'd be my chief hero in the Second World War. Yeah, exactly. How much, just how much rested on one mind, one person. When you think of how flawed a human brain is with emotions and your response to pressure and stress and things like that, these guys could operate with almost the weight of the world on their shoulders. And, you know, they would be thinking about how the future would be different if they were to take a day off, that kind of stuff. It's, uh, it's the, 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 These intelligence guys, yeah. Um, well, um, a lot of these guys are just doing routine jobs. You know, you've got a few mathematical geniuses who are really struggling with a problem. But there are hundreds of guys, um, you know, who are just um, routinely decoding routinely listening into messages and so on. Perhaps there is, um, in the post-war period, there's um, a unit which several countries now have called um, the Situation Room. It has its origins, I think, in the First World War. Franklin D. Roosevelt had his map room, for example, and um, Winston Churchill had a special room uh, in basement in, in, in Whitehall. And the intelligence flows into this room, and that's where the really important decisions are taken. And uh, that, that continued. LBJ, for example, president in the 1960s, there was a Situation Room there where the key intelligence flowed in and you had to decide what was happening. Uh, the European Union is developing uh, a, a, an organization called SITSEN, which is Situation Center, which is supposed to you know, handle immediate, immediate crises. So a few guys are doing exactly what you described there, you know, sweating it out. But a lot of, a lot of the guys in intelligence are just doing routine jobs. How did you deviate with your book, The American Left? And it was a sharp left turn, I guess, into American politics, contemporary American politics. Can we talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, when uh, I, I was researching for The American Left, I, I uh, interviewed Bernie, Bernie Sanders. It was a, an interesting experience. He was um, a, a socialist in the uh, United States Senate. And uh, the, the only socialists there uh, have been socialists in the past. And um, people looked at my projects and said, you know, you're looking at a very strange subject here. It's going to be a very short book. There's no such thing as the American left. That's partly because they failed to define the American left in, in, in the right way. You know, the American left used to be the socialists uh, and, and nothing else. And then it became uh, a broader movement, the new left, movements against the Vietnam War, uh, the women's li liberation movement, the civil rights movement. You know, that's all parts of the American left. And um, since then, you've got a, a newer left, you might say, which has developed a new agenda on issues, um, secularism, gay rights and, and, and all the rest of it. So, if, if you know, if you take a broad interpretation of the left, the left has achieved a great deal. But Sand Sanders was an interesting case. because In one sense, he was a throwback to the... Uh, to the old left, he still described himself as a, as a socialist and still does to the present day. Now, the interesting thing is that, that I think I interviewed him uh, just before Obama was elected president. And when Obama was elected president, he had massive support from young people. And 40 percent of them described themselves as socialists. Now, this is never mentioned in the, in the media, in the mainstream media. Mainstream media are very conservative, owned by private people. They don't you know, like talk about that kind of thing. Uh, and, and now we have the phenomenon of uh, Bernie Sanders constantly proclaiming the fact that he's a democratic socialist who had an enormous vote in the um, in the American primaries against uh, Hillary Clinton, and 
I think what he's helped to do, amongst other things, is to demystify the word socialism. You know, there's always a dirty word in American politics. I think it may, it may be the case in the future that it will be quite so, such a dirty word. Although, having said that, uh, there was one point on which I disagreed with Sanders. He, he's got quite um, a strong personality. Uh, and uh, I began to discuss um, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade uh, Agreement, which I think is a good, good thing on balance. And he's totally against it because he, said, he thinks that farming out jobs to Mexicans and allowing immigration from Mexico is undermining uh, the wage rates for American workers. You know, it's, the, it's the immigration issue, which you've got in Australia, uh, and which we have in this country. is a big issue at the moment with the referendum. But I, I, I just thought that was a little bit uh, unenlightened, and he should um, look instead to bring the standard of living up for Mexican workers, and you know, that'll help to erode that problem of cheap, cheap labor competition. Like you said, they, they sort of nearly had rights to the four or five states that they were once in. But when you look at it, it seems a little crazy that American politics and the direction of such a superpower would rest on two or three people. To have one figurehead, is that an outdated concept? You mean the president? Yeah, to have like a one president and you're picking three guys and it's come down to these three. That's not the best three people in America, for sure. I, I, I think they've got a, a problem there because... Um Running for president now requires so much money. And uh, they have uh, attempted over the years to reform that and to limit the amount of money that people can spend in campaigns. But people keep on finding ways uh, around it. And the, another uh, factor there is, um, the, you know, uh, buying buying time on, on, on the media, uh, on television, for example, takes a lot of money uh, to do that. So campaign in the 1990s to give more people access to express their political standpoints on the media, radio, television, uh, and, and uh, later on the the web. But there's been a, a failure, failure to reform that, with the result that only very rich people or, or people backed by very rich people can uh, run for the presidency. And uh, as you say, that really limits the pool of talent. Having said that, some of the people uh, who get through are, are, are talented. I think Obama is a very, very talented guy. Um, and he just seem to have the the knack of raising money in spite of not coming from a mega rich background and he did it of course by exploiting the modern media lots of small contrib- contributions his um digital uh, appeals went viral he had a lot of that kind of uh, support and that uh, perhaps cre- creates an opportunity for uh, a more democratic uh, field of candidates in in in, in the future bernie sanders uh, benefited from that as well, because he didn't come from a big money background. <clears throat> Hillary, though, she does really big money background, and Trump, of course, Trump, of course, is a, a billionaire in his own right. It's funny us because we're in different countries, but we watch this carefully, and it's funny looking at it. Uh, the ideas that seem to come up, like Obamacare and things like that, do seem to have the best interests <coughs> of the public involved. And and for us, you know, we're Oxford and uh, Cambridge and places like that. Britain was really founded on knowledge and education. And so it would make sense for America to base future generations within knowledge and education, reduce those college fees. And that's kind of what socialist and, and that new left talk is all about. How, why is the public resisting ideas like that? Why does it seem, it doesn't that just, it's just a no brainer. Have education, have good technology, have access to basic living needs, have a very standard. Isn't that, that's a no brainer for everybody. I don't understand what the resistance is. Yeah, well, that, that's um, certainly, uh, that, that, that is one of uh, Bernie Sanders's. Uh, Proposals, of course, that uh, education should be free, university the fees should, should should not be should not be charged. Some of the um, re- really rich universities are getting around it by having scholarships for everybody. Harvard University is so rich that they don't actually need the students to pay fees; they can give scholarships to everybody because of the level of uh, of, of endowment. But then that's just one university. Um, the uh, the rest of the universities in America, I mean, the Lots and lots of university places in America. Some of the universities did have free education, and, and, and for, for you know, decades and decades and decades, they they had that the land the land grant colleges. But uh, it's becoming more and more expensive in uh, in every single uh, in, institution, and it, and it is a problem. And a lot of people in America do go to university, but I think that the the fees are a deterrent. At the same time, of course, uh, there are other, other factors such as uh, so, social background. You know, if you, if you come from uh, very deprived area in a city. It's uh, hard for you to um, pass exams, which uh, I really pitched at. People come from middle-class suburbs. You just don't have the access to that kind of experience and, uh, and information. 
So if Bernie Sanders is championing these causes, the betterment of, uh, of a population, why is, it, why is he not getting through? Why is he, you know, Hillary transparently is lying. Bernie Sanders, has, he has got through. He's got through to the white working class, you know, and he got, he's got massive support there. And in, and, and in these poor, poor areas, he gets a lot of support. But what he, what he hasn't got, he, he seems to have um, missed a trick in two ways. First of all, uh, I don't think he's got through to the Latino population of America. The Latino population is now, now enormous. Uh, I, I mean, Spanish is probably uh, spoken more than English in California, for example, and that's by far the biggest, uh, the biggest state and the huge areas of America where there are lots and lots of Latinos. And he, he, he hadn't come, come across to them, I think, can't quite uh, put my, 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 my finger on it, but there is a, a social conservatism amongst Latinos, which perhaps uh, keeps them from supporting someone like uh, Sanders, who's regarded as too, I mean, he's, he's, he's a Jewish guy. He's not uh, anti-religion. But he's regarded as too secular, I think, by a lot of Latinos. They would prefer someone who's solidly Christian to someone like Sanders. And the other group that uh, he's failed to reach through to is uh, the black Americans, a key constituency. And that's ironic because, um, as I try to show in my book on the American left, the left has always been in the forefront, uh, fighting for black rights in, in America. And a lot of the leading black uh, leaders uh, have been socialists. For example, uh, uh, not many people realize that uh, Martin Luther King was a socialist. He was often accused of being a communist. He was actually a democratic uh, socialist. So Sanders uh, somehow missed a trick in not getting across to black Americans. That uh, has been uh, an historical alliance between the left and uh, African Americans. And that it would be a good thing to continue that. Why, why has he failed to do that? Difficult to tell. He came from uh, Brooklyn in uh, New York. You know, he must have met a lot of black guys and indeed a lot of Hispanics, you know, in, in, in his youth. But most of his life, he's lived in um, what's called the Green State, Vermont, which is very rural, um, kind of upcountry, you know, lakes and forests and fishing and that, that kind of thing, uh, regarded as, a, as an eccentric state. And maybe that's uh, rubbed off on him and his lost the facility to communicate with the people who should be his, uh, his, his, his core voters. I don't know if you, you remember the anecdote from the uh, election campaign where he was slagging off uh, Hillary Clinton, because Hillary, of course, was senator from New York, and she says, I'm, New I'm a New Yorker, she says, uh, though she's from the Middle West. And uh, he said, Hillary never, never even takes the, uh, uh, the underground, you know, the, the, the underground railroad. And uh, which is true enough, you know, he's got a good political point. So then he made a big display of going onto the uh, subway himself, and it um, and and the mechanism for paying had changed. You know, you, you can't just pay your, your way. You have to have a special token. He didn't know this because be years. <laughs> he's old. Yes, he's very old. So he lost cut, touch with his roots. You know, so he maybe lost touch with Af African Americans for yeah. some reason. It's funny how you can do one little thing and you can have all these great platforms, all these great plans. You do one little thing like that, and that's what you're remembered for. You're that guy that did that, yeah, that's a shot to say. But I just can't see, I mean, I don't feel like Hillary is a true left. Maybe she's bought and paid for a centrist. I can't really see Hillary being on the left, and Trump is so far right. No, I, no, think I, think it's a I think she may, be, um, for, she may be forced a little bit to the left. Um, you know, Sanders is busy negotiating now, I think. Uh, he'll deliver his support to her, I guess. He'll deliver his full support to her if she moves to the left on certain issues. But although she's, you know, she may not seem to be, and I know she, she's got a big money background. She, she's got $41 million uh, in her campaign chest at the moment, compared with Trump's uh, $3 million. Even Trump, you know, is, is outgunned by Hillary Clinton. But uh, she um, was, I think it must be remembered, the first person who proposed uh, a thorough overhaul of the medical system in America. She was pressing for a system similar to the one that Obama actually got through. We call it Obama. Obamacare now because he succeeded in getting a lot of it through through Congress. When she was the first lady in, in the White House, uh, Bill Clinton gave her the job of trying to get this legislation through uh, Congress and she, she failed. People took against her, you know, she wasn't an elected politician. Why should they listen to the president's wife as opposed to the president? Uh, but that's, you know, she does have that kind of background of uh, espousing. She probably wouldn't like to call it a left cause. She'd probably call it a liberal cause. 
no, she's a true believer in some of these issues. She was willing to make herself unpopular campaigning for that in the uh, in the 1990s. So I wouldn't describe her as um, a shade to the left of centre, I would say, rather than two centrists. Yeah. There was a very, very funny video, um, and it was her in, I think it was 94, she made that speech, say, and or, or whenever. And she was she was up there talking, and she said in a, in a recent interview on morning television, she's like, when I was trying to get this healthcare through system through, where was Bernie Sanders for all of that? And then they juxtaposed that with some vision of her giving the speech in 94, and Bernie Sanders is standing right behind her. <laughs> like, literally right behind her while she's giving that keynote speech. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things. I'd like to wrap this up, so I'd say thank you very much for... Uh, we obviously could talk for hours and hours, and um, we'll have to continue this conversation over a cup of tea one day. Sure. Yes, take yeah. care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you for listening to the UniV podcast. To follow our series, please subscribe to our channel via iTunes, Beyond Pod, or the equivalent service. And if you particularly enjoyed the show, please don't forget to rate. For further information, news, videos, and articles, head to univ.com.au. 